So let me introduce <laughs> Ron Lee and Gretchen Dunhauer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank so, you, Andy. <laughs> you're welcome. So no, let me uh, welcome everyone. I had uh, hoped that over this year I would visit many of you in person. I had planned trips to uh, Paris and to Shanghai and to Seoul and to Berkeley and then here in Honolulu. And now I'm greeting you from home. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to be quite as nice, but it's still wonderful to see all of your faces and hear your voices and uh, to have this opportunity to get together. So this is a new experience for us and I hope that you will be patient. Uh, hi Cassio, welcome to you. I see you've joined us. Uh, so be patient with us. Uh, we have, I think, a good technical team and uh, we have Gretchen's uh, capable uh, <clears throat> efforts on our behalf. So I do wanna thank Ron and Gretchen for organizing this effort. Uh, so Sunny Up and I have mostly just tagged along, uh, but uh, we're delighted to have the first satellite meeting of the global NTA and, and we're looking forward to this experience. It may be something uh, that we do a lot more of in the future. So uh, with that, let me uh, turn it over to Ron. The idea is that this should be um, an informal meeting. I hope we'll have lots of discussion and talking. And some of the presentations are quite polished and finished. And some of them were just prepared in the most recent two or three hours as the results began to come in. So quite a, a variety here. But the idea is that when we work with NTA at some early stage, well, medium stage, we form um, NTA estimates of relating to individuals. And then from that point on, uh, we, we may slice the uh, data in different ways. We may just form averages by age, or, or we might do averages by age and gender or socioeconomic status or whatever, but seldom do we actually use the individual estimates as individual uh, data. And in fact, I'm not sure how much we know about how reliable uh, they are at the individual level, but one of the important goals of this workshop and this group is to explore the possibilities of analyzing the individual data as individual data and using it to calculate uh, distributions, for example, so that we can um, look at levels and differences and trends in inequality. So that's one goal. Now, I know Luis Rosero Bixby has done some work along these lines, possibly others have as well. But um, for us in the US project, it's a kind of new direction. And maybe for some of the others of you, it will be also. So here are some of the uh, topics I think of that we might consider. Not all of them are prominent in this workshop, but I see them as directions that uh, this kind of work might go. So one first is just measuring inequalities uh, in flows and then perhaps in stocks. So flows would be things like labor income or consumption or public transfers and so on. You're familiar with all that. And the stock, of particular interest would be the stock of wealth. And here what sets NTA apart would be the inclusion of transfer wealth in addition to financial assets and real property, a house or something like that. And um, then given these distributions, if we can 
measure them, then we'd be able to look at uh, changes uh, over time and uh, across subgroups and so on. Um, a second question is uh, the effect on public and private transfers uh, as, because that's, of course, a strength of NTA. And if we look at um, consumption or if we look at income after transfers, uh, how does the distribution of that change from the distribution of primary income, of the labor income, and perhaps labor income plus asset income? Uh, so there are various kinds of questions we might want to explore. Uh, under these flows and wealth stocks. Now, a second kind of inequality isn't really uh, done at the micro level anyway. Now we're back to averaging and uh, estimating age profiles. But uh, here we'd be looking at age profiles by socioeconomic status differences. Uh, so many of you have already done this. We're only getting to it now in the US for the most part, but um, the most typical measure of course is education, but then we also look at it by gender or by uh, income percentile position and so on and so forth. Possibly government designation of poverty status. Um, and then we could look at um, measures of distribution within socioeconomic groupings. Again, I think Luis was doing this uh, four or five years ago, uh, sort of ahead of uh, the rest. And he did a talk on this, uh, I think at Senegal by, by video. Anyway, uh, and then we could also imagine decomposing inequality into within socioeconomic status group and between group and uh, whatever we found uh, useful. A third uh, general area is uh, the sort of thing uh, Julien Naveau has been leading, uh, that is longitudinal studies when we have repeated uh, NTAs and more and more countries in, in, in the NTA network have now done multiple uh, multiple NTAs, but uh, with multiple NTAs, then we can look at changes in SES differentials, and we can look perhaps at changes in measures of distribution and inequality. And we may be able to look at the timing if we have fine-grained uh, data, or annual data, we might be able to look at the timing of important changes uh, in inequality in relation to macro events of possible interest like uh, the Great Recession we recently experienced. Um, and then here are a couple more topics. So one question that has come up in the US and might arise in other countries is, of course, we, we project the uh, transfer needs, particularly the public transfer elderly and this, as this affects sustainability government programs and so on. But there's a question of what the tax base will be, say in 2050 or 2060, a number of decades from now. Um, so it's, you know, it's common, we sort of project forward productivity growth at one or one and a half percent per year, something like that, decade after decade. That may be fine, but on the other hand, it may be that that productivity growth depends a lot on growth in the human capital of the labor force. And there's been concern that the growth of human capital and labor force may not be uh, as much as it has been in the past because uh, increasing proportions of children uh, in the U.S. now are born to parents who have uh, themselves rather low levels of education and uh, low levels of economic uh, 
well-being and so on. And so the children, the future members of the labor force may have less human capital than we would expect if we just projected on trend. Well, perhaps we can actually do projections using the NTA foundation, uh, projections of the future uh, human capital of the labor force. And perhaps we could base such a projection on the SES group, say the educational status groups. So we can estimate fertility and mortality by educational attainment, their uh, estimates of that sort for the US and I imagine other countries. So you can project, well, one possibility is to take the uh, sample survey used for NTA, take that population as a population in, of individuals or of households and families and project them forward, taking into account uh, the uh, group levels of fertility and mortality, and then also taking into account either the amount invested in the human capital of children in each socioeconomic status group, or perhaps um, using educational transition matrices in which you um, estimate the proportion of people who come from whose parents are in one educational status group who get varying degrees of education. So we've done that sort of thing in other contexts that can be done. And maybe in these ways, it would be possible to do something interesting on the side of projecting labor force uh, uh, quality or human capital. Uh, do we have a comparative advantage in that through NTA? I'm not entirely sure that would require some more careful research. Well, I've talked rather too long about that. The last thing is capital intensification. It's sort of a related topic. Um, we generally think that population aging is going to bring increased ratios of capital to labor. Uh, that is capital intensification and that that will in turn cause falling uh, rates of return to capital, falling interest rates and rising real wages. And that's, uh, in fact, population aging is often um, given as a possible reason for the long-term decline there's been in real interest rates. But will the, as the composition of the population changes uh, by educational status and human capital and so on, will the savings rates and asset accumulation we've seen in the past continue to hold in the future as we project things forward? If not, um, maybe there won't be these changes that have been widely expected. So those are some of the themes um, that I think of. Uh, as I say, we're not going to explore all of those in this workshop, but some of them come up and maybe some of them will come up next week or next year or whenever. Uh, and now what I'm gonna do is turn it over to Gretchen who will explain something about uh, the process of asking questions and Zoom and technical matters, perhaps if there's anything that needs to be said. But thank you very much. Uh, Gretchen, you want to take over? I don't know how to- Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Ron. So just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, so we are uh, recording this and we are recording both the sound, the audio and the chat, and that'll be made available on the uh, NTA wiki. And so we have a record of who came. If you could at some point or other text your name and email into the chat box. I think many of us now are Zoom experts, but if you are not a Zoom expert, um, you just mouse over the Zoom screen and a bunch of controls come up on the bottom and there's a chat box. Uh, click on it and then you can type in your name and your email. Um, just so we have a record in the chat of everybody who attended. Um, generally, it just seems like we're all muting ourselves when we're not speaking, which is good Zoom practice for audio quality. Um, if you have any technical problems, you can use the chat box to contact um, Berkeley AV, send them a message and they'll help you figure that out. Um, 
Let's see what else. And then once we get to a sort of Q&A session, it seems like we have quite a few people here. So um, I think the best way probably to handle that is if you click on the um, participants box, you'll see a list of the people who are here. And there are some controls there. And one of them is raise hand. So once we get to Q&A, um, if we could use that box and then we'll let people um, just say their questions out loud as sort of typing all the questions in the chat can sometimes be hard to both listen to the speaker and follow the questions at the same time. So we'll just try to have a, an audio conversation when it comes to Q&A. Okay, and uh, I think that was all that um, I was going to bother you about in terms of housekeeping, and I will turn it back over to Andy. Thank you very much, Gretchen. And uh, so, now we're turning to our first session and to Bernard Hammer, who is our lead off batter, talking about combining income and consumption data at the household level. So uh, <clears throat> I think you received uh, some guidelines, Bernard, that uh, the presentation should be 20 minutes uh, less if you would like to have more discussion. Uh, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for each of three uh, designated discussants. If there is any remaining time, then we will open it up to uh, others uh, to ask questions or to make comments uh, using the procedure that uh, Gretchen outlined. So you'll just uh, collect that you, would, you want to raise your hand and then you can speak. Uh, we don't intend to rely on the chat box uh, or much of anything now that you've entered your name and email address. Okay, so with that, let me turn it over to you, Bernard. Okay, thank you, Andy. Hi, everybody. I will tell you a little bit about the uh, first step in generating um, NTAs based on microdata. The goal of this exercise for Austria, or one of the goals, was to uh, analyze in detail the intra-household transfers. So to be able to analyze these transfers by other aspects than simply by age. My presentation will have basically two parts. First, I will speak about the method of building this micro database. We have to combine consumption data and income data because for Austria we do not have them in the same data source. And uh, second, I will uh, only shortly use this data to analyze the role of the families in the generational economy in more detail. So what was the motivation of doing so? It was twofold. I was always wondering about this negative savings rate in the NTA age profiles. I was wondering because I thought people are not this saving to finance their consumption. So why do we find this negative saving? Uh, so it, it's usually at the age from about 20 to 30 and we find it for many countries. So my first idea was it, it is uh, an effect of our methodology of combining income and consumption data. Because at these ages, there are largely, or highly stylized now, two types of adults. Those living in own households, and they are likely to have higher than average income. Those still living with parents, who are likely to have less than average income because they're still living with parents, maybe they're students. And when, imp when we impute using the average wage, uh, we have now rather little income because this average income is lower than the actual income of those who live in their own household, which results using our methodology in this saving of these households. While we get an underestimation of the intra-household transfers for those living with parents because their actual wage is lower than the average wage which we imbued. And so my idea, okay, we need to better into account for the correlation between income and consumption at household level. 
And the uh, second motivation is that we are able to analyze the intra-household transfers in more detail. For example, get estimates of intra-household inflows and outflows. So when we use age-specific averages, we average them out already. So the, the, the inflows, outflows profiles we get are not actually in and outflows. There are already some type of, uh, so some of these flows are averaged out actually. And I would also have be able to analyze the intra-household transfers by parental status because it's an actually not an age which drives our age profiles. It's the relation between uh, fertility and because, uh, of having children that shapes our age profiles of intra-household -trans, uh, intra transfers. So let's start by combining income and consumption data at the individual level. I'm using two data sources. First for income, I, as it's two survey data sources. Uh, for income, I use EUSILK, which includes yearly income at individual level. One problem, which we'll see later, is that asset income is not or very badly captured in this survey. And for consumption, I'm using the consumer expenditure survey, which includes consumption at income at household level. We have to take into account that we observe consumption only over a two week period, although larger uh, consumption items are taken into account. So in this survey, there's a huge variation in consumption between the individuals, of course, but also between the two weeks period. So there are individuals with very high income, very little consumption, because in this two week period, uh, they just had little consumption expenditure and also other way around. So people with little income, very high consumption expenditure because this two week period was observed when they were uh, having high expenditure for consumption. So to some degree, we have to aggregate this consumption date and I was estimating a very simple consumption function or expressing as a uh, linear regression an analysis expressing the consumption of an household, the CJ, as a, uh, let's say, function. We have a component which is autonomous consumption. So we assume that everybody, even those who don't have income, need to consume at least a basic amount. Then a part, we have to take into account that consumption increases with income. So this beta one in this equation is the a marginal propensity to consume out of income. And uh, I also take into account some economics of scale in consumption. So when there are increasing number of household members, the uh, autonomous consumption per member decreases because they are able to share some uh, of the consumption goods. Yeah, and I'm using this uh, equation or this model to impute uh, consumption expenditure of households in the income survey. When we, I mean, we for sure make some mistakes when imputing using this model because there are for sure some households who, who consume actually much less than the autonomous consumption that we um, assume for them. But we also have to be taking into account that it should not affect our analysis, which in our case, the most important thing is the age profiles. And when we calculate the age profiles based on, also when using the NTA age profile of consumption, which is solely based on the consumption expenditure survey and compare it uh, with the imputed values, we see very similar pattern, except in old age, there are some differences. So the imputed values underestimate the consumption at age 60 to 70 and overestimated in old age a little bit. However, I mean, consumption is quite good, I would say. Uh, a little bit uh, problematic is the difference be between the income in the survey and the income age profile uh, in the in NTA because for estimating income, I'm using different service, I'm using a tax expenditure and a wealth survey. 
and the consumption at age 40 to this, uh, not it's not in its income at age 40 to 60 in the NDA is higher than in the survey data because it's not captured well in the income data also in the in the survey data for income so what I did uh, to adjust for these differences I made a post imputation adjustment I the impute or the, I adjusted the imputed values that the age, age averages correspond to the age profiles. So we have micro data and the imputed values I adjusted. So then when I'm calculating age profiles, these age profiles are exactly those as we have in the NDA. Also in these are disadvantages because we distort, the, we distort the relation between income and consumption again, but also advantages. It fits better to the NDA age profiles and it might reduce the effect of an inappropriate imputation model. For example, these differences in old age. In any case, I'm, uh, it would be good if we can avoid this. So it's an suboptimal solution so to say and possible improvements could be to find better consumption function uh, so that it's actually the imputed values give us the NTA age profiles and survey data that captures asset income better or we impute asset income into the income survey because it's not well captured there so now, after this adjustment, when we calculate the age profiles based, based on our micro data source, they are, of course, very similar to the NDA age profiles because of this adjustment. We can take then this data, this micro data, to calculate the intra household transfer inflows and outflows. And we can calculate also a savings profiles. And what's happening now, this uh, decline at age 20 to 40 is even stronger than it was before. So even when the data is not perfect, my, my first uh, thought that it's the due to our methods of using these averages is not correct. Then I thought, okay, what could be the reason? And Finally, uh, I discovered that we, also we miss somehow the regular, the intra, inter household transfers in the data because there is very, not very good data on uh, transfers between households. But in NTA, we also miss these asset transfers. And young persons are very often supported by their parents or grandparents in this phase uh, at this age 20 to, to 30 about. Uh, for example, they get the present when they get married, they are supported when they found a family uh, or found their own households. This allows young people to consume, uh, let's say, this save the assets they receive from their parents and grandparents and uh, have a higher consumption than at, at, at their own disposable income. And I think this is the reason for this negative saving in this uh, period from 20 to about 30. So this is that we do not take into account asset transfers to younger people and young people consume out of these assets, uh, asset transfers. Uh, some people also get confused in NTA taking a loan for financing assets, for example, a house or a flat is not directly captured in the NDA since it doesn't affect net wealth. So you just accumulate net financial transfers and positive uh, real transfers. So uh, we, uh, the second goal was is to analyze the role of the family in the, trans in the transfer system a little bit in more detail. Uh, taking uh, this age profiles of intra-household transfers and outflows, we can calculate also the aggregate values. And if we have uh, value for or diff, also if we have profiles by men and women, we can show this in such an economic uh, 
population pyramid. So this green area are the transfer outflows. The orange area is the transfer inflows, intra-household transfer outflows and inflows. And what we see, of course, is that most of these transfers go to children, a little bit for older children, because we assume that they consume more. So they get a little bit more. And these intra-household transfers are provided mostly by men. If we look at, at a, a non-market work, we would see exactly the opposite pattern, but men have higher income. They support, also they provide a larger share of their income for their children. And there's also a, a sharing between partners. So men have higher, higher income, transfer a part uh, to their female partner. And if we calculate the total trans, uh, total private transfers, so we, uh, they amount to about 33 billion euros in Austria, of which about 21 billion euros go to the de uh, dependent children. For comparison, pensions amount, uh, also pensions alone amount to 48 billion euros in Austria. But this, tr also these transfers to children are paid by a compare also by a comparable small group of people because most of them is paid by parents and i would like to to show uh, how much it is actually for parents and how it affects their income so this shows the uh, the share of the population with dependent children, which shapes our age profiles at age 40, around a little bit before, before most of the people or the largest share of the population have dependent children. This shapes our intra-transfer household age profiles. And in this graph, I try to show, show the income which is uh, represented by the green area. I call it final disposable income. It's the income after intra, disposable income after intra household transfers. And here I don't distinguish by age, but by life stages. Distinguishing uh, young people or young labor, young people in the labor force who do not have a child parents with younger children below 14, parents with older children, then older working age, age population who do not have dependent children living in the same household and retired uh, people who do not have dependent children. And what we will see here, this orange area, also the, the, high, the height of the past represents the net disposable income for men and women. The orange part is the share of the income that is distributed to children. And the green part is the share of the income, which I call final disposable income. So disposable income after intra-household transfers that remains with the, with the parents. And yeah, it's, uh, we see better how a large part of the income of parents is redistributed with the family to children. And finally, parents end up with a much lower disposable income uh, than other groups in the population that do not have, uh, that do not have children. I'm not so happy yet with the way of show it, but it's, it's just uh, in the making and I hope I make progress in, in showing this and also visually uh, showing this intra-household transfers, their importance and also the effect on, on the economic well-being the, of the parents. So what would be the next step uh, in our exercise that would be to estimate also the public transfer outflows on micro level. So public cash transfer are of course included in our micro database because they're included in the income survey. But um, it would be not too difficult, I think, actually, 
to use this micro data as we have them now, including consumption, including income at individual level to estimate also the public transfer outflows, for example, uh, taxes, social contribution, depending on the socioeconomic characteristics of the people in the micro database. We could use, for example, the Euro, Euromod uh, micro simulation model uh, to do so. And yeah, I think that would be the next step what I'm trying to attempt. And there are, of course, this public in-kind transfers. Uh, it's not so clear how we deal with them in the micro database, but public, edu uh, public education transfers received could be, for example, based on education status. That should be not difficult because we have information how, where people are enrolled, in which level of education. And public health could be based on a risk-based approach. That doesn't, that means we include or we, we estimate these transfers received, not on the actual transfers, but say, okay, what would be the insurance premium of, of basing the age or, the, or the financing the age specific risk uh, of these transfers? All in all, I would like to have a data source or a micro data that allows us to address the following questions. Is that is, are families, which are the group with the lowest disposable income and the highest risk of poverty, net contributors to the public transfer system or net recipients? Well, yeah, this is the uh, questions I would like to answer with um, NDA micro data. We have now a first step and uh, estimating this uh, public transfer contributions based on micro data would be the next step that I'm planning to attempt. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. That's a uh, very interesting, a great presentation, a good start off for us. So let me ask uh, David McCarthy to start out our discussion. So the first, the, the first issue that Bernard brought to mind was, you know, if, if we do calculate micro NTAs, um, we've got to think about the cross-sectional variation of consumption and income, and hence all the derived profiles. We need to worry a little bit about how much of this is real. And I think Bernard raised a very important point um, in that section of his presentation. And it's, it's because consumption is measured over, at least in the UK, and I, I don't know how it's done in, in, in any of the other countries, but at least in the UK, consumption is measured over two weeks and income is, is retrospective over a year. And so, you know, I think the, the point that Bernard makes is a very, very interesting one and, and I think a very valid one. And what that might do is introduce some artificial variation into micro NTA estimates. Because what we've got is we've got consumption that varies hugely for a given individual over a two week period. And there may be significant negative autocorrelation in consumption over two week periods. So, you know, you may capture the two weeks when the individual goes to Costco and does the monthly shop, uh, for instance. And that means that, you know, if you stable, make these estimates more stable over a year, um, while it doesn't affect our average NTAs where we just average everything out anyway, um, I think what it will do is it will induce quite serious or could potentially induce some quite serious excess and entirely artificial variation uh, in our distribution of both consumption and all of the profiles that we that depend on consumption and those would obviously then include intrafamilial transfers um, the same issue would arise in in uh, intra inter household transfers depending on the time period over which those transfers are measured um and and so so i didn't fully understand what bernard was doing but it seemed to me that um his solution of Im imputing consumption off the income um survey so what what i think he did if, and bernard if 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 i'm misrepresenting you i apologize um but it seems as though the, what he did was he he Im Im used the 
annual estimates of income, which would take into account any auto negative autocorrelation over over smaller time periods to impute uh, consumption, and that's certainly one one way of getting around it. And he described various um, adjustments that he needed to make. Um, and I think that this this is an issue that that I think we're going to have to grapple with uh, when we do um, micro NTA, uh, which I didn't actually consider before reading um, Bernhard's um, presentation. So I think that's something that that he definitely provoked a, a, a thoughtful response in me at least. Um, and the second issue that, that Bernhard's presentation brought to mind, particularly the second section, has to do with endogeneity. Um, and you know, when you when you do a regression of association that measure associations between individual and household characteristics, and then the distribution of NTA micro NTA profiles, what are we? How are we going to think about endogeneity? And I think, and the reason that Bernhardt's presentation brought this to mind so strongly was because of his lovely point about the the rush hour of life being the decision to have children. Um, and so, you know, if if the decision to have children is is in some way endogenous, um, then we may well misrepresent um, in our regressions any relationship between any of the associated variables and the and the NTA transfers that we, or the micro NTA transfers that we estimate for each individual household. Um, and I think, you know, this point will affect both um, cross-sectional and longitudinal micro NTAs. So, you know, sort of to, to Ron's point right at the beginning about whether we look at this thing in a cross micro NTA in a cross-sectional way or in a longitudinal way, um, I think this end endogeneity point um, is going to stalk us um, in, in, in both of those approaches, possibly to different degrees. Um, but, uh, but I'm not, you know, I, I think it's just something that we need to think about and, and before, maybe before we just throw up our hands and, 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 and move on. Um, but those are really the two issues that, that I think Bernard's very interesting presentation brought to mind. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, David. That's uh, very stimulating. Commentary. Now let me turn to Michael Abrigo, who is going to join us from, must be early in the morning in the yes. Philippines. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you so much, Bernard, for the presentation. I, uh, there are two slides that strike me the most. Um, the first one is on the plot on parents with dependent children where you show the uh, bar graphs with final disposable income. And I guess uh, this shows, notwithstanding the technical details that uh, David has discussed, uh, it, 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 for me, it shows uh, the potentials of what we can do with um, NTA microdata. And here you're showing that um, after transfers, uh, disposable income among different um, household types are actually closer with each other as if uh, compared with, uh, you, you are only looking at the total income of individuals. And I guess that's one strength of using um, NTA microdata. Uh, the other graph that um, the strike me the most too is the one where you show this um, age distribution, population uh, pyramid with private transfers paid by um, men and women. So I'm not sure to what extent um, does our invitation method um, uh, conditions these shape because as we know, as we know in, in NTA, we're using this um, sort of uh, mechanistic model where we assign transfers to household heads and I'm not sure what, what, how it is in your country, but here in the Philippines, mostly these households heads would be men of particular age groups. And that would somehow, well, in the Philippines, at least it would condition how the transfers would look like. And I guess it's nice to tie this with the work that the CWW is doing on uh, women's work. And maybe if we have those data too, in, in this graph, then maybe, we could, uh, the plot would be more, um, say, more balanced. It would look more like the, the population pyramid uh, 
as compared to here where you have most of the transfers being paid by men, uh, middle-aged men to children and to uh, women, um, older women. Uh, that would be all, thanks. Uh, now let me ask Sang Yap uh, to offer his comments. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so, I mean, this is a very important actually topic, important issue. Uh, so uh, what Bernard is talking about is the so-called uh, uh, uniform reference period, URP versus mixed reference period, MRP, which is actually a quite important topic in statistics and data, uh, data and survey. So there is, I mean, I'll just, I would like to uh, recommend just one uh, World Bank project on this topic uh, in India, because before 2000, they used uh, this uh, URP. Then URP means uh, information. Consumption uh, data is based on record of the consumption expenditure over the last months or, or two weeks. Then in 2000, actually, they changed the method, collection data method and data uh, on um, like uh, less frequently items are collected over a one year period and uh, frequently you know, consumed items are over the one month. So they changed the, the, the uh, measurement, the survey ways, and then actually it changed the inequality and, uh, you know, the Gini coefficient and the consumption, uh, the poverty line. So it actually has a huge impact on their measurement. So it's actually quite the important topic. So, it is, I mean, Bernard is addressing whether this, uh, uh, you know, survey data based on uniform reference period, the URP, is the right one and it's a poor quality. Uh, so that's actually a very good topic. And then, uh, this is actually very relevant to Korea because, uh, you know, uh, Statistics Korea actually made their NTA uh, uh, official statistics, right? So this was the actually big, big issue when we construct intra-household transfers because Korea does not have, uh, you know, um, uh, income and expenditure survey. They only have expenditure survey on one hand, right? And the other hand, they have uh, income. So we have to merge it to data sets, actually. Uh, what Bernard did is that it's more likely using proxy. So it's like a poor quality. So as everyone knows, if there are poor quality measures in when you calculate intra-household transfers, it's, it's like a measurement error problem in econometrics. The both the outflow and inflow are uh, biased toward zero. So in some cases, actually, you have a very, I mean, zero outflow and zero inflow. Probably Gretchen actually knows it better than anyone else actually here. So you actually, to correct it, you have to have a both uh, kind of impute to mean and actually standard deviation. So that means actually in the optimal ways that you can impute, you should impute the mean as well as the standard deviation. But that's actually very optimal. But for example, in Korea, uh, they didn't have anything. So they considered the three methods. One is uh, impute to mean and the correct standard deviation using another uh, our source. So second way is like what you did, Bernard, run a regression and uh, predict the value and impute. And the third one is that actually calculate the mean based on cell. Cell is uh, like a different characteristic. So you run a regression, right? Based on like uh, their income and uh, their household members. But instead of doing that, uh, like calculate the mean by household members. So this is a mean of the income for one you know, single family household. And that this is uh, with the two members. So they actually decide to choose the third one. The reason is it's actually a very heuristic approach. You, you cannot find any optimal way to do it, right? So you actually run the regression to predict the consumption. Uh, but the problem of the Statistics of Korea was that, I mean, it changes every year. So your estimate coefficient ch changes every year and they didn't approve the method. So you, you should have a consistent method to show the like change over time, right? So instead of doing that, they create two cells. The cell is by gender, age, and the number of family members. So it's like five members, five cell times two gender, two, right? So five times two and times age. So you actually calculate the mean of each cell and impute the that value. So it's actually very similar to what you did, but it's, uh, it's uh, much more, I mean, understandable. And, uh, you know, it's uh, actually easy to uh, persuade the, the, you know, the this statistician because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, when you say, oh, this is the change over time, 
the change can be driven by your estimate coefficient. So it's actually hard to persuade the statisticians to do to that way. Actually, I discussed it with Hyung Kyung because Hyung Kyung was uh, actually one who created these ideas and we had a very long discussion about how to impute the numbers, okay? And uh, those, uh, this, uh, there are actually minor things. The minor thing is that like uh, in your regression, if we, you actually have uh, like a zero household members, then the consumption should be zero, but you actually have this autonomous consumption. That's another problem, right? Because uh, you have uh, every year you have different coefficient and uh, you have a different like uh, intercept from autonomous consumption, which can be, can vary a lot. Uh, Economy just care as well. Uh, so, so. Uh, setting up, can I suggest you forward these detailed suggestions to Bernard? Sure. Uh, because we're yeah, those out, are details. But the important thing is uh, we're this is, uh, out of time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I don't have much time. So, so this is a very important issue. This is uh, actually a, a quite important issue. You know how your measurement uh, uh, changes depending on your variable, especially in income inequality when you measure income inequality. And there are a couple of ways to do it. Uh, but somehow the Korea statistics actually chose the third way instead of running regressions because of uh, this consistency over time. So that's it. I mean, let me actually stop here. Okay, thank you very much.